Okay, so welcome back everybody from our little break. We're going to move right along here with Chris Adams. Chris is an environmentally focused tech generalist, spending the last 10 years working in tech startups, blue chip companies, and government as a user researcher, product manager, developer, sysadmin, and UXer. He runs Product Science, a small product development consultancy, and he lives in Berlin, where he's talking to us from today. In 2017, he created the Planet Friendly Web Guide to help people who build the web build greener digital products and services. Today, Chris is going to give us an overview of how changes in the fields of UX, cloud computing, web performance, and product design for Internet of Things all affect the environmental impact of what we're building and some useful frameworks for thinking about how to make measurable improvements. So if you are ready, Chris, you can take it away. I think so. I'm so glad you introduced me there because in my slides, I was like, oh, Christ, have I actually written anything about that? Who, are these, who is this person? So hello, everyone. I'm going to be speaking to the people in this room because there's a number of people here. And I just to prove that there really are people here, I'm just going to ask everyone to just make some kind of noise like hello or something. Hello. See? See? Yeah. All right. OK. Now I've got the crowd on my side. Awesome. So as uh, Jen mentioned, yes, my name is Chris Adams. Uh, I am a kind of sustainable UX uh, veteran, I suppose, is the best way to describe this. Uh, in 2016, I did a talk about working out the carbon footprint of the internet with uh, greener clouds, uh, which was a one I was using Neuro for, this kind of remote workshop tool. And then uh, last year, I did another talk called Building a Planet-Friendly Web, where I presented a mental model to help you think about how you build digital products and the environmental impact inside them. So for today, this talk is going to be a little bit about that and uh, what changed in the last few years because things have changed. That's progress. So the TLDR, like too long didn't read version of this talk, is basically this. There is now very, very good guidance on how to do this and how to actually build sustainable tech. And it's extremely comprehensive and very, very complete. It's also extremely dry and, very, and not much fun to read. And uh, I spent the last weekend reading over 233 pages of just the stuff for ICT. And it goes into stultifying detail. But the, one of the key things I realized when I was looking through this is that you can, you can read through this stuff. And uh, I guess some of you even might. But what, there's one single measure uh, that I found was probably the most useful thing that you could really do. And I'm going to kind of give you a brief update, of, uh, a kind of overview of this stuff and what's changed for this. So first of all, oh, the other thing is that this mental model here more or less maps conceptually to the actual formal guidance that's actually been put together by large companies and uh, academics and PhDs who spend a lot of time looking at this. So I think of the environmental impacts of the digital products and services we build in kind of three main areas, all right? So one is platform, which is essentially your infrastructure that you're running. So that's like your servers and stuff like that. And the next one is packets, which is a kind of the environmental impact of sending stuff to people so they can access it through their devices. And then the final point is, is final one is process, which is basically how your organ organization is set up, uh, where, which basically bakes in certain amounts of emissions to how you work that you might want to think about as you're, as you're building digital products or running a, 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 a digital business. So first of all, I'm just going to dive into this. So for platform, I spoke before about this basically being your service and your infrastructure. And there are two kind of levers that you have uh, that are kind of accessible to you here. Uh, one of them is provisioning, uh, which is basically how big or how many resources you actually apply to something. So let's say that you're going to be running a website. You might be running a server. And it might look a little bit like one of these. But you don't need to have a really, really big server if you're not running, if you're not running a really, really big website. You can also run them on things like Raspberry Pi, like this, as one of our earlier speakers spoke about. And it's, it's useful to bear that in mind that you, the actual size of what you're using or the, the kind of server can actually, you can match that to the kind of load that you want to actually have. It's also worth bearing in mind that, this, that there, are, there are patterns to how people use like the internet here. And this is a, this is what you're looking at here, this is a line chart of basically how everyone uses the internet. Uh, but based on usage patterns from uh, looking at, say, broadband and such, and, and such things from the report, Power of the Wireless Cloud. So you'll notice that there was a tendency over here for people not to use the internet while they're asleep. Who knew, right? And then as people wake up, 
they tend to actually start using it more and more and more. Then as they at, at the office or working, you'll see more of it. And then as you go home, you'll see another spike where everyone goes home and watches Netflix or something to that effect. So you'll see this common thing happening a lot of the time. And you'll, you're, this kind of pattern is also something you'll see in how your websites are actually accessed. You'll see kind of curves and spikes in many ways. And uh, oh, typically, if you are going to have an audience, the way that you would actually kind of make sure that people could access this website was you'd basically buy a machine that was, was, was powerful enough to kind of deal with the, the, the peak when everyone's trying to use something and you just take it on the chin because it's actually quite complicated to set up and run a server. So all this region around here, this is like wasted energy, which in our case would basically be emissions, which are kind of wasted here. But there's not much you can really do about that because basically running these services has actually been quite a complicated thing. Now, as we move to things like, say, using cloud computing, this has become easier. But a lot of us have just been in the habit of just paying on a monthly basis to buy a machine that's big enough to handle the, the spikes and then just being done with it. Now, what's actually changed is that over the last few years, you see a kind of shift where we abstract, we become abstracted somewhat away from the code. So rather than running a server ourselves, you'll often have lots of small machines and uh, you'll actually have something like, um, rather than thinking in terms of a server, you'll have maybe an application that you run on a, a series of smaller servers. And these are about you like kind of virtual machines, I suppose. And uh, you can think of this in terms of rather than having a giant box, which uh, is designed for all of this, you might have a series of smaller machines which, are kind of, which you switch on and off or spin up and spin down in response to the amount of uh, demand you have for the services you have. So this is kind of cool in some way. I mean, the kind of technical term, would, well, this would be kind of horizontally scaling because you just add more of them uh, that way. I'm trying to make sure which, who, I, who I do this to. And um, this is kind of cool because you basically are matching demand uh, and usage to, uh, uh, well, to usage really. So all this blank space here, this represents energy not being used, and in our case, emissions not actually being emitted, because basically a large part of the web still runs on things like coal. Now what we're moving towards now, and it's becoming increasingly popular now, is this idea where you don't actually have, you're even further abstracted now. So there, there's a, there are some buzzwords that you might, use, you might hear used here. Some people might call this serverless, some other people might call this functions as a service. But the general idea is that you're really, really far abstracted away from this. And rather than thinking about, I'm going to have a, a set of small computers, you basically are thinking in terms of running something you, and, and being billed for having, say, two machines or one virtual machine or something like that. You've got companies like Amazon uh, with Lambda or Google with Cloud Platform basically billing you per request. So you do not pay to use any of this. Uh, when it's not being used. And uh, you end up with a very, very, very close mapping of how you, of basically the usage to pattern. So you're not wasting so much power this way. And uh, for the cloud providers who do this stuff, they are able, because they have so many users, they're able to basically make use of the fact that you know, there are these troughs and these peaks in demand and essentially power things down and then pass on those savings to you. So this is why the billing model is somewhat different, but it also means that you have an incentive to actually read it, th th design, your, to design your system so that you can take advantage of this stuff and actually save emissions just by not actually running things. So this is one way that you might do this. Now, and this is actually one of the reasons why we've had people talking about data centers and this growth. And uh, we've had people speaking pre on previous talks and also in general uh, in, in the media, this idea that IT runs around 2% of emissions. Of, of global emissions. So right now, computing, or IT in particular, has about the same carbon footprint as aviation, which is, or maybe it's slightly less than, say, shipping. So this is large. This is like greater emissions than, say, Poland, actually, or even, or I think even Germany, actually. But because we're seeing these changes in how our data centers work, the actual data center use has not actually grown as fast as we, as we first thought. Uh, a few years ago, we were really, really worried about this. But essentially, changes to how people run things, uh, run data centers, mean that we've actually been able to avoid some of the worst excesses of this. And like this chart here, to give you an idea. So back in 2010, where there's lots and lots of academic reports, and you see lots of breathless reporting, there was this idea that we were going to be going up and up and up and up and up 
And uh, you'll see kind of some stories along the lines of, well, basically cryptocurrencies saying it's going to use more power than basically like half of the world or something like this. Uh, you have actually see that's not so much the case in many cases. Well, in Bitcoin, it's because the market is basically falling out of it, and therefore it's now costing more money to run the servers than they can possibly get back. But in this case here, it's people are actually just designing servers relatively well, and actually the efficiency savings are helping out here. And um, you can actually see this. Uh, this is actually another chart from the IEA, who are the International Energy Agency. So they are pretty good at looking back uh, they are like what the kind of body globally that basically decide or give forecasts to how the demand for energy is going to change over the coming years. And uh, in 2014, you can basically see that we had a load of, say, traditional data centers like this. The kind of ones where if you work in a medium company or something larger, you might have, say, some service yourself. And then you can see that as we move, the trend is basically to have these larger kind of hyperscale data centers eat up all of this stuff. So you've seen this shift from relatively inefficient, uh, energy, uh, energy hungry uh, servers to something like this, which is why we've been, we've had this case where we've essentially like tripled the amount of uh, CPU use we do uh, and, and like usage of these things, but emissions have largely stayed the same, which is pretty impressive actually. So this is one way, but basically depending on how you design things, you can actually have an impact there. The other way that you might actually have an impact when you're building stuff is actually think about how you, who your provider is, where you're sourcing the power from. And uh, I need to say right now that it's very difficult to find out if a website, what kind of power it's running on. And even if you do ask, there is this kind of alphabet soup of terms to, to actually help you to, the people use to talk about, to, to, to basically justify or say that they're running on renewable power. So some people might run things directly on renewable power, which is great. But in many cases, you might have things called regos or, or, or recs. These are basically various bits of paper which, which let you say, I've bought some renewable power somewhere else in the grid, and this is what I have. Or the regos is actually an example of you say it's, it's something that you actually use to prove that you've, generated, that you've bought renewable power in some cases. A PPA is a purchase power agreement. So this is something that say, uh, if you want to build a wind farm, you'll often find companies that will do this. They'll so say Google, for example, they will buy a purchase, a power purchase agreement from a, uh, a generator of wind farms, and they'll say, well, we'll buy all your power for the next 20 years. And that certainty lets them build something. So there's loads of things like this. But really, I don't, I'm of the opinion that this is not something that people who are actually building things really want to know, because it's really dull, and it's also, it's, it's a fraction of complexity. I spent three years trying to make sense of it, and it's still really hard. And when I did find someone who was a, an MSC, she said, yeah, Chris, the only way that you can do this is basically to be a master in this. So it seems a little bit unrealistic to expect every single person who runs service to do a master's in environmental studies before they can actually make an informed decision about how they run their service. In fact, there is actually, I kind of think that what you need is something a bit like this. And frankly, this exists. There is a company called the Green Web Foundation, and they do some very, very clever network stuff to basically look up a website. So this is the Sustainable UX website. And uh, they're able to see who's running it by basically tracing the path through the network, really, to find out that, say, there is a, a Dutch company called Green Geeks LLC who run all their stuff on wind. So you get a smiley face, and you actually see that I've actually got something like this up here. And so there's a browser extension you could just use when you're visiting websites and find this out. And this is how we know that Sustainable UX is green, which is nice. Google is green, which is nice. Twitter, not so green. So not so, not so great. And like this is a, this is a kind of relatively easy thing that you, you can actually have. And I kind of feel like this is the level of engagement that you can reasonably expect a end user to actually have. I don't think it's realistic to art too, for people to understand the entire gamut of different financial instruments you would use to finance renewable power, because it's just, it's just a fractal of complexity. And if you do want to run on green power these days, let's say you're building something, it's so much easier than it was now. So I've mentioned this kind of alphabet soup of instruments that people use. Amazon, Google, and Microsoft all use these now to provide green power in various places. Now, it may be that not every region is green. So for with Amazon, AWS, if you run all your stuff in, say, Oregon, because there's loads of hydropower, you're going to have relatively like, you're going to have as close to zero carbon as you can probably get from Amazon. 
if you run things on the right on the, on the other side of the coast where there's, where you're deep in coal country you're going to have pretty high co2 comparison so this is the thing and this is actually the, the large companies they tend to use these tools quite a lot but if you are like a kind of if you want to go for i don't know og just direct renewables you can actually do that as well and uh, there is a directory which basically lists this kind of stuff but at the moment it's not particularly easy to find uh, a, a company that says yes we only run our stuff on renewables that we only get directly simply because energy markets are quite complicated but essentially there are lots of options available to you and it's up to you to decide how much of a purity you want to go down this route so that's kind of platform that, that's your platform part and those are your two main levers if you want to reduce the impact that you actually have uh, the next question is about packets which is basically the emissions associated with, with you sending data to people and this is really 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 hard to measure and uh, I I've lost a lot of sleep trying to make sense of this simply because there are so many different things to actually measure because when you look at the energy market the energy grid like the, the, the national grid you have to think about okay so what power is running when so during the day you can have solar when you can have it at night you're not going to have solar so that's going to change the amount of carbon associated with running a, just like a, maybe a kilowatt hour of power and in addition to that different countries have different policies so they have different ideas about why, where their priorities are so France really likes nukes so they're going to have quite low CO2 compared to other companies, uh, other countries. And also, if you have different networks, have different energy demands. So if I'm accessing a website over a phone instead of over a wired network, there's an impact difference there, which I'll talk about. And then finally, there's different boundaries. If you're going to try and look up this information up, different people have different ways of deciding where the internet ends, where the internet begins. So some people will have a study, will say 30 pages long, and they'll basically say, yeah, uh, we've included computers here. And other people will say, no, this hasn't included computers here. So this makes it even harder to work this out. And uh, to give you an idea, just in the EU, I remember that like when you kind of access a website, we think of like the cloud as there's no geography, but it's going through actual bits of geography. So it might be going through loads of nukes, which is low, you know, low CO2 might be going through, say, Poland, which really, really likes coal, which is really high CO2 by comparison. Could be even Estonia, which are like really, really bad. Or maybe you're going through, you're using stuff up here where it's super green because there's loads of like mountains and things and those are running water. And then it gets even worse because all these countries trade energy with each other. So it gets even worse. So like this is really, really complicated. And uh, I've been losing quite a lot of sleep trying to find, trying to kind of calculate this stuff. And uh, I've actually finally found some guidance from this. So there's a group called the GHG Protocol. They basically are the kind of, I don't know, master accountants of anything to do with sustainability. They provide all the guidance for this. And they finally published in 2017 some guidance about this kind of stuff. And uh, in order for them to do this, they had lots and lots of people look at this stuff, loads of peer review. And uh, you end up with stuff like this saying, basically, yeah, there is a giant, there, there, we now know there's a difference for things like, say, wired versus wireless. So if I'm using, say, a mobile phone, I now know that the impact is quite a lot larger. So if I do, don't know how many people are using uh, my, 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 my service from which, which devices, it's going to be that much harder. I could be 45 times out. And then if you look at this, let's say we're going to uh, uh, take an average of these studies. Some of these studies say, well, okay, it's like 0 0.0064 kilowatt hours per gigabyte, which works out to be, I know, this much CO2, or it's a larger number, which is like 20,000 times larger. Now, this is like, this has impacts on uh, if you're trying to actually work out the carbon footprint of this, any of this yourself. And uh, I, I'll give you an idea for like what, what, what kind of impact it's going to have, because most of the time we're not very good at putting these to numbers and having some example makes it a bit easier. So let's say that I wanted to offset, say, the transfer, the, the energy usage uh, for people accessing my website, and I had this much variability. I might try to kind of offset it, like, say, I'm driving somewhere, right? So if I, let's say I'm, I'm in Kreuzberg, and I was going to offset me driving to, or just keep track of the emissions associated with me driving to here to, say, Tegel Airport, which is about 20 kilometers away, people in America and all around the world, right? So it might look a bit like this. This is okay, I can work this out. Um, the thing is, it's like if I have, 20, if I have something like 20 kilometers uh, and I think, well, did I drive that far? If I'm 20,000 times out, that's like saying, did I drive there or did I drive to the moon, right? 
So this like it's a crazy, crazy number. There's so much variability, and it's really, really hard to come up with these numbers. So there are things you can do to kind of reduce the scope of this. So one example would be that you can actually say, let's only look at the studies that don't include, say, end user devices for this. And this is actually some guidance people use. So you'd have 300 times. So okay, that's a bit better, right? So 300 times between the highest and lowest. That's like a difference of me saying, did I fly from London to Madrid? Do I offset that? Or did I fly from London to the moon? Once again, this is really, really, really silly. And it's like, it's really hard to come up with some numbers. And now you can do something like this. This gives you an idea of how complicated this stuff really can be, all right? But let's just pretend it's easy for a second and come up with some worked example because you know, we, want, we, we want to believe that we're doing the right thing. And uh, there, this is something we've spoken about in many of uh, previous uh, talks. And I've also spoken about this as well. So a good example would be, let's look at, say, oh, the nice thing is last year we had something interesting happen. So there was the kind of advent of GDPR, which was essentially a kind of super privacy law that made lots and lots of ad-focused companies fill their trousers because suddenly it really threatened their business models. And uh, you saw lots of cases where you'd have, say, companies or, or companies which ran, say, publications like the USA Today, which is a good example. They would have, say, maybe a website and 90% of the website's kind of uh, uh, load was basically ad tracking and ads, right? So you have a five megabyte web page and 10% of its content and the rest of it is just like, cruft that we don't want, right? And uh, they just switched off all their tracking because they realized that if they didn't switch off all their tracking, they were in breach of this new law with teeth. And uh, this law was, it has real teeth. It's like 10% of your revenue per offense, right? So, uh, and your revenue as a, com as a company. So you do not want to be on the wrong side of this law. And uh, so we can use this as a kind of case study. So let's say that you were to redesign the website, uh, the, the redesign a website and take away 90% of all this stuff. And you look at, let's look at a large organized, a large website. So this one here is in the top 500 websites in the world, say 3.7 million people visit this on a daily basis. All right. So you take a five mega, megabyte page, multiply it by 3.7 million times. And essentially though, we can do some stuff with gigabytes per hour and things like that. But the figure that you end up with is something like 18,500 gigabytes of data per day. That sounds like a lot, right? Um, we've got, we take this number and then we say, well, okay, now we've got a figure of how much data we're moving, how much energy does it cost to move a piece of data? And then we look at the national grid. So in this case, it's the US, so it has a quite a lot of coal because, uh, for basically uh, government, I suppose, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and subsidies for fossil fuels over there. Uh, and uh, and if, we, if we look at the numbers here, we'd say, well, we've got a figure of, 0 0.06 kilowatt hours per gigabyte. And this is in 2015 that we have. Now, this where it gets more complicated once again, because like technology moves on, we have progress. And uh, the thing that you find is that essentially we are getting better at running uh, websites and running the internet. And uh, energy use is roughly halved every two years. So we should probably take that into account if we can do that. So that's brought us down to 0 0.03 kilowatt hours per gigabyte in 2017. And this is actually like last year. I didn't want to do it last year because I didn't want to do a kind of halfway between this. This was, The math was easier this way, right? And uh, that worked out to be about 248 kilograms of CO2 per day that are being emitted by just data transfer, right? And I think, well, is this a lot? Like we have such little understanding of this kind of stuff. Uh, so, but you can, like, you, you can try looking at this stuff. Um, this roughly works out to be a flight from New York to Chicago. So every day, by switching off all the ads, they are saving a flight from New York to Chicago, or in our case, maybe Berlin to, I don't know, Port uh, Berlin to Lisbon or something, for example. Something like that. That's the kind of footprint that you're saving each day. So I guess that's all right, better than nothing. It's also, it doesn't seem that big as well, because like a, if, you, if, if you take like a round, a round trip flight, then you've wiped out some of that. So maybe this is not as maybe there isn't that much impact there after all, and you've got to ask, well, is it going to stay like this? Well, what if energy does kind of get cleaner because we have this kind of shift in this direction? And uh, yeah, like over the last say 10, 10 years, we've seen a really interesting change happen. We've seen that we are basically renewables get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, which is good and more popular. And we've seen fossil fuels get less and less popular to the point they're being taxed now to the point now that in Europe half of the coal-fired power stations are now loss-making because we have taxes on CO2 emissions 
And this is actually working in our favor. Like green power is actually becoming more and more attractive. And like we can point to some ex examples. This is the UK. UK had something like this over the last 20 years. Their energy grid has got way better, largely by them switching away from coal, which is dirty and, quite, and, uh, and has these taxes, to basically things like gas and stuff, which isn't great, but also increasing amounts of wind and solar, which is great, fantastic. You see the same thing happening in the US as well, despite all the work from, uh, from, from 45, right? You see this stuff happening here, right? You see that in the, a few years ago, electric power got, has been getting cleaner as well, mainly because people shift to gas. So you're seeing this, and like, if you're going to try and track this stuff or have some kind of meaningful discussion about it, you're going to need to kind of think about this stuff, right? And it's for this reason that I start thinking that increasingly you can make an environmental argument for not sending so much data and stuff over the wire, but I'm not sure it's going to... I think that people will be able to challenge it quite easily in this way that I've spoken about this. And uh, I also think that, to an extent, this is actually... Like this may be the case for how it works in the UK or, or in Europe or in, or in the West, but we're seeing like to an extent like the, the amount this ship has sailed about of sending people to stop using so much data, right? So this is this is India, right? This is uh, one of the is one of the most uh, largest uh, phone companies there. Now for 199 rupees, you can get a 1.4 gigabyte per day package. So that's three euros and one and a half gigs a day, all right? Like, these are just so, there is so, this is like mind blowing for us. And this is the norm now. People just use like YouTube the way we might use Google over there, all right? And uh, like, like, like I was saying, there is a, the way people use the web is different and we need to kind of take some of this stuff into account. And you've got to think sometimes, well, where's this usage coming from? So we're talking about web optimization and why that's important. This is uh, the most up-to-date information from the Sandvine Internet Phenomena Report. What they do is they basically, uh, Sandvine build network solutions, uh, uh, network tracking tools, and they release a report each year about how, what's being used, what's popular. And you can basically see that, like, if we think about how we design websites, which is like this bit here and this bit here, then we look at how big Netflix is alone, which is like, Netflix is fully like nearly 15% of like the internet now, right? And YouTube, which is like 11% here. Like you can see that we can do as much as we want to make a website work a little bit better. But if we try to kind of say that this is that we, we're basically going to have to be telling people, no, you don't get to, you don't get to uh, eat this, you don't get to fly, and you don't get to watch Netflix, right? Like this is not a way of winning hearts and minds. There's got to be other ways that we can do this. That's to say, I'm not saying we shouldn't care about this. There's stuff you can do. This book I found fantastic for talking about how to actually talk about web performance to people because you're basically building websites because people like them and because people because uh, it because it's the right way to do it rather than because you think you're going to be saving the planet. And I really think that if you do try to make this planet saving argument about this, you will be laughed out of the room. So please don't do that because there are definitely places where we do need to actually be uh, using our influence, all right? There's another website called Perth Tooling Today, which is probably the single best resource I can find about this, all right? So that's kind of it. So we spoke about platform, we spoke about pack packets. I'm going to talk a bit about process now, because I, the thing that I've learned is that, yeah, things have changed over the last few years. Uh, if you want to understand the carbon footprint of the rest of how an organization is working, there's a few tools available for you. There's a, a common group is a common thing is actually B Corp. So B Corp is uh, the best way to you, you can describe it is essentially business for good is what is what you can think of them. There's a number of companies that now are B Corps. Uh, so Whole Grain Digital is one company I'm going to reference before. They do this, and it's essentially it's people who want to run a business but also do care about I don't know treating employees well, having some kind of sensible ratio between how much people get paid from the top to the bottom. There are also things about say uh, thinking about the environment. There's loads of really good guidance in there. And if you do not have a in-house CSR team, there's a lot to be said from, from from looking at what they have. And they also provide a lot of support. So there's also if you want to look look, look out work out the carbon footprint of your IPT, there's also a self-assessment tool which I'll link to here. And uh, Whole Grain Digital, who are wonderful, and I really, really like them, they actually shared their own spreadsheet for working out this stuff themselves. And I kind of think of Whole Grain Digital as like, if we want to be, if we want to be like web professionals, and we want to be responsible about how we use technology, 
they're about as close to good looks like right now, all right? And like a, even then, so they kind of wrote this blog, blog post that was saying, this is how would you do this. Here's what we've done. We're going to share our resource, the tools that we've used, so you can do this yourselves. And uh, for a company of, say, 15 people, they said the, the emissions are about 10 tons of CO2 for the entire company. So that, that works out to be around 0.7 uh, tons per person, per employee per year. And they were looking at, well, they've done, they're doing all lots of the right things. They don't fly all the time to conferences. Uh, they, 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 they tend to run things on green power. They, they, often, they often work from home a lot. And even then, you can see like large hotspots of the emissions. I think like say travel, simply because you do not have control over how they, the grid is powered in the UK, for example, where they're based. Likewise with say office energy and home energy, there are things you kind of don't have that much control over yourself. And uh, this kind of brings me to this idea of conferences uh, because like this is sustainable UX. It's a remote conference, even though there are physically people here right now who I'm speaking to. Uh, so it's a kind of blended conference, I suppose. If we were to do like unsustainable UX, right? We were going to run a conference where it was just the way that it normally works. We we could we could see how much the like what kind of emissions we save by doing this. So there's a company called My Climate. Uh, they're based in Berlin. Uh, they're also uh, I, and uh, they have tools to actually kind of work some of this stuff out. And uh, what we're looking at right now is kind of like the mean figures for all this stuff. You can go into this stuff and do and bore yourself by working out the numbers for all this stuff, like what, what food do people eat, how do people travel, but we could just do like the average. And the average would be that, yeah, if you're going to run a conference, more than, so 77 out of 83, more than 85% of the emissions are from people traveling there. All right? Like this is... This is, this is actually like a thing that we need to be able to talk about because when you talk about things like the remote, like doing remote conferences, there's, a, there's often a thing about saying, hey, I need to have the hallway track. I need to be able to talk to other people and have that kind of connection. And I guess that you're, one of the jobs that we would have as designers and people who actually pride ourselves on thinking about user experience is finding a way to replicate that sense of connection that you do get when, you are, when you're experiencing the hallway track or being able to bond with people. And there are things you can absolutely do. There's loads of theory, but we need to just like start thinking about this as, a as an industry, because this is going to be one of the biggest sources of savings that we can actually make. Uh, the other thing that you might want to think about that you probably haven't thought about so much is if you have any kind of pension or savings, that is probably one of the biggest areas uh, in terms of any, uh, kind of impact versus, well, I guess, social capital that you would spend yourself. So after Paris, uh, in 2015, there was this kind of COP23, uh, uh, sorry, COP21, and this is the idea, let's not cook the planet, let's stay within two degrees of warming, right? That sounds great. You saw loads and loads of pension funds pile into coal after that, all right? And uh, you basically have massive exposure, so if the majority, lots and lots of pension funds have this exposure to basically buying, in, uh, uh, bu buying say, fossil fuel stocks in companies, when the governments have basically said, look, we, we're not going to, we can't possibly burn this, uh, bur burn the, all, all, all the kind of reserves that these, coals have, these companies have, which is in their kind of stock markets and their, and their valuation, we can't have this work. And there's, there's a phrase called the carbon bubble, which refers to this kind of stuff. And uh, right now, if you are by default invested in this stuff, you're kind of exposed to a huge amount of risk because essentially there are, these companies have valuations based on them being able to burn all these fossil fuels, which the world has basically said, we can't burn these fossil fuels. And at some point, you're going to have this come to a head. And uh, you could be invested in that, or you could not be invested in that. Like, that's a decision for you to make, or at least check, because there are ways you can ask. And this is like a relatively low risk thing to ask in an organization, but a pretty good way to actually get out of fossil fuels and redirect that money more productively to more useful things. And you might wonder, why am I talking about energy and fossil fuels so much? When it's about sustainable UX, right? Simply, it's just like if we look outside the web industry, like there is, this is something that we, we, we will basically the, the web and tech industry is actually relatively easy to fix, right? The solutions are really quite obvious, uh, comparatively speaking. And we do, and I'm just going to point you to like an example of what this stuff is going to look like. When you, there is, um, I won't expect you to kind of dive into too much about climate, uh, cl climate models, but generally, a lot of them look a lot like this. So if we want to kind of avoid the worst of emissions, we want to have this kind of massive drop off like this. And what you'll often see in some cases, you'll see things like, say, CCS 
or geoengineering, meaning that we can continue acting like this a little bit longer so that we can basically keep making money for companies which are deeply invested in fossil fuels and stuff. And then we'll have to kind of make it back by, by, by kind of going into negative emissions over here. And this is what people refer to when they talk about like carbon capture and storage. Or well, one phrase people use is bioenergy carbon capture and storage, which is a way of pulling CO2 out of the air, which is a little bit like kind of paying back a credit card debt, but on a planetary scale. And in order for you to do this, when you look at the actual stats of this stuff, if you, uh, the, these, these scenarios where we avoid the worst of it and we have this kind of overshoot scenario, there are huge amounts of land being used for, essentially, it involves huge amounts of change of land use. So you're talking about people taking, say, something like five times the site, five times the land mass of India to be used for basically growing stuff and then burning it to actually keep carbon uh, out of the sky. Like it's just to take carbon out of the ground. And like, this is going to be incredibly disruptive to anyone because if you think of like the land mass of India, like who, how many people does that displace? This is, it's probably not going to be people in this room. It's going to, be, it's going to land on people who, once again, are the least, least, least responsible for this kind of stuff are going to be hit by this. So I feel there's kind of moral argument for us not to be looking at this and to getting out of fossil fuels as, much, as fast as we can. So I kind of think in terms of the easy thing to think is just keeping this stuff in the ground. And that's like the most useful thing we can do when I, because I've showed you that essentially there are things we can do individually about redesigning stuff. But seriously, the biggest thing is just don't run all your stuff on fossil fuels in the first place and find ways of doing, of working without this. And I kind of think that we should be able to talk about emissions or talk about energy like this. Like we're in the 21st century. We should just have this idea that, yeah, energy just comes from renewable places. That's it. Of course, that's, that, that, that's what it is. And uh, the thing I was going to talk to you about here is that it's easy to kind of have this idea that, well, what about how do I fly? Or how do, there's all these kind of sectors where it's really, really complicated to actually decarbonize. But there actually, if you, if you spend enough time reading into this, there, there are actually options and things you can do. So making steel, for example, typically you burn low. This is like the, this is like the, the, the third largest source of emissions in Germany. Uh, I, I believe is, uh, is, is, is basically smelting steel and things like cement. If we go back up here, we saw that one of the things was, this is basically from the creation of cement and fossil fuel combustion. So we're used to using this kind of stuff, right? But there are ways you can do this. You can actually create steel without having to burn fossil fuels. There are ways you can do this now. And in the longer version of the notes, there's actually a load of articles I can point you to for this. Likewise, travel. So there's this idea of, um, so maybe if we, we, we were talking about flying before, right? Right now, this chart shows you basically, this, this, basically, this is a, a chart showing, say, the UK breakdown of how, of, of, of basically what flights, what kind, what kind of distances people fly right now. And right now, we're at the point where we're just starting to see things like electric planes moving to, uh, move, into, move into here. And there are some things that you can actually do. This is actually from a report called uh, Electric Dreams. And they basically say that, yes, you might be able to actually move towards electric planes in the next, say, five years. So if people are actually doing something with this. In the long run, you won't be able to do this stuff because just the, about the energy needed, the energy density to actually do long term, uh, long, long flights, you'd need batteries to be like 300 times uh, better than they are right now. But we are able to basically make liquid fuels from renewable energy and, and existing uh, and things like say, well, naturally occurring, uh, say like CO2 already. There are like t things available to us, but all of this stuff basically requires a large amount of renewable investment into renewable energy. And like, uh, these are the kind of figures that I see uh, basically thrown around right now. And this is another reason why one of the most useful things we can do is basically pile into renewables because we basically need to kind of build like a new society with no fossil fuels in it. And that's going to take a lot of investment. So if you want to think about what you're doing in terms of uh, working as a professional in technology, the most useful thing you could probably do right now is actually make sure that every new thing you build uses renewable power and you ask for it, all right? And uh, I'm running, I'm running short on time, but basically the last we are seeing, we, we're seeing like an improvement in uh, how much people are actually getting deploying renewable energy. But this is in the face of flat investment, right? So if we were had more, we could actually see it, we, we could be moving so much faster because we need to be moving that much faster. And uh, one of the reasons that we don't see that much investment right now is that we basically see this like this current old guard of people who basically say we cannot 
where there's an assumption that you're unable to kind of build or build, build a kind of a new society based on things uh, which isn't using renewable power so much. And the nice thing is you see things in America right now where you have like say the Green New Deal talking about this, like we need to decarbonize. And uh, this is basically, this shows you the growth of solar. These are the forecasts every year for the last 15 odd years by the International Energy Agency. They are like catastrophically bad at predicting the growth of, of solar, all right? And uh, these are, this is what's kind of deciding or, or deciding what, if, whether things get built or not right now. And um, I kind of think that maybe there's a chance to actually have a really, really simple message. I don't know, maybe make the web green, something like that. But this is probably the most useful thing you can do that I can think of right now. Um, the thing I was going to say, uh, I actually started to work with the Green Web Foundation. Uh, so in March, I'm working full time with this lot to basically make all this tooling open and open source so that you can actually see this and uh, you can find out how websites are being powered rather than just saying, are they green or not? Because understandably, some people will want to find out about this. And if you're watching the talk, the, uh, I'll share a link to this notebook which shows all this stuff. You can join the main list to find out. The other thing is that if you like the idea of doing this kind of stuff and using your skills to basically make it easier to move to a zero carbon society, then there's a cool thing called the Prototype Fund. This is what's funding me to do this. Uh, they will basically pay you 47K uh, and give you six months to work on open source projects focused around climate change. This is like an amazing deal. There's like 25 of these positions open this year. And if there's something that you want to work on that has an impact here, like apply, apply, apply. Like it's, I went through this myself, they were really supportive. And it's a really, really cool thing. That it's like one of the most useful things you can do. You get paid decent money to work on the defining challenge of your lifetime if you're in Germany. Like this is great. Like I can't, I can't stress how cool this is and why they, that they shouldn't be, that, that every single person I know, please, please look at this stuff or tell someone who could do it. And like, that's kind of it. My name is Chris. Uh, thank you for like listening to me talk at you and I know I've gone a little bit over, sorry. And uh, yeah, this is, this is how to get stay in touch with me. I'll share a link in Slack. Uh, I won't be around for questions because there's a few people here that I need to speak to but, uh, and actually field questions from. But thank you very much for uh, listening to me talk at you. And uh, see you in the climateaction.tech Slack because I'm quite active in there as well. Thank you, everyone. Cheers.